It's our wonderful Lord and Savior. Good to see you here in the house of the Lord today. Good to be in God's house on this Lord's Day and also on this Father's Day. I would welcome every one of you. We do have some visitors in the audience. We're always glad to have our visitors to come and be with us and worship with us at Northside. So we appreciate your presence today. And you that's listening out in the radio listen audience, we most certainly appreciate you tuning in to the Northside Baptist Church Hour that's coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church here in Athens, Georgia. Now this is Preacher Edward speaking. We're hoping during the next hour the singing will be a blessing as well as the preached word of God. And if you get on your phone and call a friend, have them to tune in, especially shut in. You'll be doing them a great favor. And we appreciate that very much. Take your Bibles and turn with you please to the book of Luke chapter 15. Now today is Father's Day. And we appreciate the presence of all the fathers that are here. We'll be recognizing them at the close of the service. And we'll have a little gift for the oldest and younger father, youngest father present. Now Father's Day is set aside of course to honor the fathers like Mother's Day. It's not a day to be used to honor yourself in preference to honoring God. Now what I'm trying to say is this. At any time, a Christian father, or supposed to be Christian father, a mother, that allows things to happen on that particular day because it is Father's Day, that calls them to dishonor God by not being in God's house, then they're using Father's Day as a hindrance to the cause of God. It doesn't honor God. Now, you need to remember that. You have a lot of hen-pecked men that are so hen-pecked that have to roost on the foot of the bed every night instead of going to bed where they should be, that they let just anything keep them away from God's house. And because they find some little petty excuse and claim to be saved. Now, I stand in doubt of men that are so spineless that claim to be saved that can't uh, be the head of their homes and say for me in my house, we're going to serve God. We'll be in God's house on the Lord's day instead of finding some silly, petty excuse or using some little silly excuse to lay out of God's house on the Lord's day. It's a shame. Now, most of those people like that are really not saved and it grieves the heart of the pastor. Because if a person is genuinely saved, they're not going to look for excuses to stay away from the place where they should be on the Lord's day. They're going to try to make it possible to be there. And if a person continues to use excuse, then it may be they're not saved. I contend that if a person is saved, there's something on the inside of that man or woman that will cause them to want to be found at the place of worship on the Lord's day. The Bible said about Jesus, it was customary that he was always in the synagogue on the Sabbath. And then the apostles and people that served God in the early church were always in the place of worship on the Sabbath and very busy for God during the week. And so it's always good to see men that are men. Now say for me in my house we're going to serve God and say to the wife and children our place is in church on Sunday and we'll be there unless we're in the bed or have a broke leg or can't make it. We'll be there on the Lord's Day. We're not going to let Petty excuses keep us away from the house of God because we're men and we love God and we're not a bunch of spineless hen pecked fellows like a fork and stick with a pair of breeches on. Now we need men that know God, that can serve God, that's got backbone. That'll be men. There's a crying need for men today. I mean men that will stand for something and men that has conviction. Now we have some terrible things happening these days. A terrible thing happened the other day when the Supreme Court struck down all hindrances to abortions. And now a woman can get an abortion if she's six months pregnant or even seven or eight or whatnot without any problem. And many of those unborn babies have been aborted and they're very much alive and kicking and crying and then they put them to death. Now, beloved, God is not going to put up with this type of stuff forever. There's been at least a million or more unborn babies murdered every year in America. And it's costing over $700 million to get it done. 
and the Supreme Court, men that should have backbone and common sense and judgment and fear of God enough to have done something about it, but they struck down all state hindrances to abortion. Woe be unto those men when they face God in the judgment. And because of eight evil men, ungodly men, there'll be millions more of innocent babies, unborn babies murdered during the days to come. People here in America are now murdering at least a million or more a year, and that'll be on the increase. Now we raise Cain when we think about, or we did when Hitler killed six million Jews, but we don't have many people saying anything about people murdering a, a million unborn babies every year, and that started 10 years ago, and that's been over 10 million. And we don't say too much about the Supreme Court, the liberal Supreme Court, uh, they're saying, uh, passing the law, that it could be done and now not restricted in any manner. Our president's going to try to get something done about it. I hope that he will, because God is not going to put up with this forever. Now, you think about murdering over a million little babies every year, putting them to death, murdering them, killing them, and you think God's always going to put up with that? Absolutely not. And so we need some men in Washington on the Supreme Court bench. We need men today as senators and congressmen and governors. As I stated some time earlier, I was so disappointed in our governor whenever he allowed a, dis a disobedient, rebellious woman to get him to sign a resolution to repeal a law that had been on the books 102 years, a law that was biblical, put there by forefathers, that the man should be head of his house. And when he permitted that, that fixed me with him because he's not the head of his house, evidently. And he's not the kind of man you need in a place of authority, a man with no more backbone than that. And take it, the place of God and strike down that law when that law is of God and placed in there because it's biblical. And our Christian forefathers knew that. And so when people sit in the place of authority and claim they're no more than God, they're deceiving themselves and they'll answer in the day of judgment. Now that is not my message. You turn to Luke chapter 15, that is a message, but not the message I'm going to bring today pertaining to fathers. I'm going to speak today on the great deeds done by the prodigal son's father. I won't have the time to read all of the scripture in Luke chapter 15 of all the three parables, or three parables in one, but we'll begin with verse 11. And he said, a certain man had two sons, that is Jesus said that. And the young of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. And he divided unto them his living. Not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country. And that wasted his substance with throughout his living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land. And he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. And he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and despair, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and I am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father, but when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion. And ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and I am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand, and shoes on his feet. And bring hither the fatty calf, and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again, and he was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. Now there's certain characteristics here about this father I want to point out to you. And this message will be on cassette tape. It'll be tape number 81. If you're interested in the radio listening audience in this tape, it'll be tape number 81. I do have many tapes available now. And just write in and say, Preach Edward, send me tape number 81. Enclose a gift of $5 or more to help pay for radio time and pay for mailing expense. We'll get the tape in the mail to you. Ten tapes or more, four dollars each. Twenty tapes or more, three dollars each. I have twenty-six tapes on Revelation. I have nine tapes on the Book of Ruth. 
God permits me, we'll have at least 12 tapes on the 23rd Psalm. We have other series of tapes we won't have time to mention. I have at least 200 or more tapes, cassette tapes available in my study. Always glad to get out the gospel by means of uh, these cassette tapes. Now today as we talk about the father of the prodigal son, we find a wonderful father here, a gracious father, a father that had character, a father that had a real backbone, and he must have been a good provider and a good father, and he would not have had a good home like he had. God had blessed him. He had money. He had cattle. No doubt he was a great farmer, and he had respect of his children and the servants. He had many servants there that tilled the soil and worked on the farm and looked after the cattle and so forth. And this man must have been a good man, a good provider. Now the Bible says a man that won't provide for his family is worse than an infidel. You have a lot of sorry men today that's too sorry to provide for their families, too lazy to work, throw away their money, gambling and drinking and carousing and living in sin and their poor families going like and suffering. They are sorry and no good fathers. They are souls that need to be saved, but they are sorry as gullidert when it comes to character and being real men. And their fathers won't even carry them to the house of God, won't take them to Sunday school, won't encourage their wife, his wife in doing so. And that's really bad in this day and hour. And they'll realize that someday. Now this father here was a great father, had great character, and a good provider. If you can't be a good provider for your family, for God's sake, don't marry that girl. Leave her in the home where she is. Well, parents can kind of look after if you're not too sorry to be a provider. Just let her be. You're not man enough to be a man. You got no business of marrying a girl and taking her out of a good home and neglecting her and failing to provide for her and providing for a family. Now, you need to think that through and count the costs before you marry a young girl, you men. God's going to hold you responsible for that. Joshua said, for me in my house, we'll serve God. No ifs and ands and buts about it. He didn't say, I'll check with Mrs. Joshua and find out if it's all right to serve God and do right. He said, no, we're going to do right. Now, that man is made in the image of God. He's the nearest thing to God on the earth. The woman is made in the image of the man. And God holds that man responsible for his household. And it's always right to do right. And he don't have to consult with anybody on whether or not it's right to serve God. Every man ought to know that and assume that responsibility and serve God and command his household to do likewise. Now we find this prodigal son here left home. No doubt he was a hippie of his day. Walked up to his dad and said, I'm tired of being under the rules and regulations of this home around here and I'm tired of you telling me what to do and I'm old enough to know what to do and I want to do my thing and other young people are doing it and I'm going to join the crowd. Now his father didn't say, now wait a minute, bud, you're going nowhere. His father realized there's something on the inside of that boy that made him want to do that and about the only way to get it out of him, just let him hit rock bottom. No doubt his dad had prayed for him and counseled with him and helped him as he grew up and the boy should have known better. And he said, I want the goods that fall to me. Whatever I'm to inherit here, I want it. And the Bible said, the father said, all right, if you de determine to go, I'll go ahead and give you what belongs to you. And he gave him that that belonged to him. And this hippie took off. He was going to have a good time. And he set out in the faraway country. And man, he was a spendthrift. He had spent that money right and left. And he found out he had more friends he could take care of. Boy, that's crazy about him. He was a real buddy. He was a good friend. That is, as long as his money lasted. But whenever he had spent all of his money, he found out he didn't have any friends at all. His closest friends then were the hogs in the hog pen. Nobody cared anything about him. All they wanted was his money. Now, that's a lot of young people today. Mother and dads worked hard, provided them with maybe a nice automobile and a little spending money and they got a lot of friends. Wonderful. Those friends come around, they ride together and have a good time. Now you wreck your car and get into trouble and see where you'll find them. Get in jail and see how many will come help you. You won't find a one of them. They just want to buddy up with you for what you have. If a person can't buddy up with me when I have nothing, he can't buddy up with me if I have something. 
And you ought to feel the same way. A friend in need, a friend indeed is a friend in need. A man that's a real friend to you will stand by you through thick and thin. While it's raining, while the sun's shining, while the storm is coming, he'll still be standing by you. Now this young boy took off the far away country. And there's a great message in the first two parts of the parable. I won't have time to go into that because it represents the working of the Trinity. And then he goes to a faraway country and he sees his need. And now after he hit rock bottom, he's dead all the time back home concerned about him, knowing, uh, knowing rather that sooner or later this boy would hit rock bottom and would be back home. And I want to point out some wonderful characteristics of this father. I want you to notice at least five, which is the number of grace. Now the father was concerned about him every day that he was at home, away from home rather. And while he was a great way off, the father saw him, verse 20. That implies that the father was looking for him. The father was concerned about him, worried about him every day, prayed for him, no doubt day and night. But he was looking for him while he was a great way off. He saw him coming. He was indeed concerned about that boy. And any father that's worth the salt that goes to his bread is concerned about his children. And secondly, he had compassion on him in verse 20. He loved that boy in spite of the boy's problems, in spite of his sins. There's a man one time visiting a feller and the boy was unruly. And the visitor said to the dad of the boy, said, if that was my boy, I would kick him out of the house. The dad said, if that was your boy, I would kick him out too. But said, he's my boy. And that makes a difference. Now, regardless of how far your family goes in sin or how disobedient your children may be, if you're the right kind of mother and dad, you still have a heart for them. They, they deep down in your heart and you're concerned about them. And you care for them. And so this dad had compassion on this boy, although he had spent all of his money, lived a terrible, wicked life, he was concerned about him. And then when the father sees him coming, he runs to meet him. He ran to meet this boy. Now this is the only place in the Bible that you will find where God ever got in a hurry. And this is only the type. God's always took his time in whatever he did when he created the earth and took him seven days. He took his time. Everything God ever did, he always took his time in doing it. But here we find a type of God in this father running to meet this wayward boy. So if God ever gets in a hurry, it'll be a time whenever he, he wants the sinner to come to him and the sinner comes in his direction, he's anxious to meet him. That shows that God's concerned about lost sinners. So he ran to meet him. He didn't go out there and cuss him out and say, that's good enough for you. you that's, uh, I'm glad that happened to you. No, no. The Bible said he ran to meet him. And then number four, he fell on his neck and embraced him. In spite of the boy having odor on his body like a hog pen and dirty filthy clothes and barefooted, no doubt. Needing a bath, needing a shave, needing a haircut. This father falls upon him, puts his arm around him and embraces him and lets him know that he's welcome back home. This is typical of a sinner coming to God and God wants sinners to know today, regardless of how far they've gone in sin, that they can still come to God and be saved. They'll be embraced by the love of God and the sins washed away. Now, number five, the, fa the father kisses him. That shows you the love of this father toward his son. He didn't say, now you low down dirty dog, you go straighten up and wash, take a bath and get shaved and apologize and then I'll kiss you. No, sir. The father kissed this boy in spite of his filth, in spite of the terrible odor, he kissed this boy because this boy was his boy. And he loved him. He didn't love what he had done, didn't appreciate what he had done, but he loved the boy because the boy was his own flesh and blood. And the Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now this boy was very sinful. He, he's very broken up. He, he admitted his faults. He said... Uh, just make me one of the old hired servants. He said, you know, I've sinned against heaven in thy sight, and I'm not worthy to be called thy son anymore. He took a real humble, repentant attitude about what he'd done. 
And any father with any heart at all, seeing the boy broken up and sorry about his misdeeds, would have accepted him back into his heart and fold. And that's the way God accepts sinners. Whenever they repent, they realize they need to repent and turn to God. God accepts them, washes them from their sins, and makes them whiter than snow. That's the love of a father toward a son. We have some great fathers today. Thank God for them. We have some that's not so great. And a great father is a wonderful person. We need more of them here in America. We need more statesmen that are real fathers. And not a bunch of jellyfish that can be bought over and pushed around by the RA and a lot of these other Satan-inspired organizations. We need to realize we need some real men in America today. I'm reminded of a story that Dr. Gardner told. It's very touching. Dr. Gardner's father was a minister, and at this time he was selling automobiles, real fine, clean-cut gentleman. And he knew a man that had come in there several times to purchase automobiles or to talk with him. And he saw this man coming in. Seemed like he was often disturbed about something. And uh, Dr. Gardner said to him, he said, called him by name. He said, sir, I, I notice you're disturbed about something. Are you bothered? Are you troubled? Can I help you in any manner? This man, tears come in his eyes, said, sir, I'm glad you asked me that. I need to talk to someone. Dr. Gardner said, come on here in my office. And he went in his office, he excused the secretary, locked the door. They sat down. This man said, Dr. Gardner, I'm so glad that you invited me in. My heart's so heavy, my heart's so broken. I need to talk with someone. He said, go ahead, sir, and tell me what's on your heart. He said, my wife and I are married at a late age. And said, we wanted a son, a child so badly, we prayed and asked God to give us a child. And then it was discovered we would have one. Said we were so happy we could hardly behave ourselves. Said we counted the months and the weeks and the days for that child to be born. We could hardly wait. And said the time came, my wife to go to the hospital. Said I was so jubilant I could hardly behave myself. I was out in the waiting room waiting to get the good news. And my wife delivering our child. And he said then I saw the doctor coming out and he said... Uh, Doctor, what is it? Is it a boy? He said, yes, it's a boy. Oh, he said, thank God we want a boy. He said, doctor said, uh, can I go see my baby boy? He said, uh, you, the wife's all right. The wife's getting along fine, sir. But said, I'd rather you wouldn't see the child. He said, doctor, I want to see my child. He said, it'd be better that you don't. But he so insisted that he see the child he went in and saw the little fellow's head all deformed and out of shape and looked horrible. The doctor said, uh, he'll never make it. Said, you can take your wife home in due time, but leave the child here. It won't live long. He said, doctor, we'd want the child so bad that we're just going to take him on home anyway. We just want him. We love him. The doctor said, well, if you insist, you can take him on. So they carried the little fellow home. Little head all out of shape and but they loved that little fella as he began to grow. They watched over him day after day. A terrible looking little creature. Very much retarded. As the little fella began to grow up, he became violent. And so the, his dad said, well, mother, I'll just go and sleep with him in the bedroom and look after him every night. He went in and slept with him in the little bedroom and only had one piece of furniture to him, and that was a chair. Afraid to have any other in the bedroom because the little boy became violent many times and Tried to destroy everything that he could get his hands on. For years, this dad slept with that boy. This boy never recognized him to be his dad, never recognized his mother. Is that much retarded? Head all terribly out of shape. This dad said, I woke up one night, he's trying to choke me to death. I finally got his hands around my neck. Said, another time I woke up, sir, and he had broken the arm off of that chair and he's just about ready to hit me over the head with it. But I slept on with him night after night. It said, Doctor, here a few days ago, it happened. He became so violent we couldn't keep him in our home any longer. We had to carry him to the institution. Said, that's the office hour in my life. Said, we went down to the institution where they keep these violent men. Said, we went down that cold carton by those steel doors and bars. Said, we came to that old steel door where I was to depart, leave him and go back home. 
Said they unlocked that door and they let him in. Said he continued walking down that hall, that deformed head. Said I stood there, my tears running down my face. And said, you know the boy, the man, he's a young man at this time, said he never looked back. He said, you know, Dr. Gardner, if that boy had turned and looked back and said, Daddy, I love you. He said, I'd have tore those bars off of that wall and got my boy and carried him back home. Oh, if he just said, Daddy, one time in his life. He just said, Daddy, I love you one time. That'd been it. Deep down in the hearts of dads, that's a love for their children. Many times they like the mothers closer, and I guess that's all right. Dads don't mind that. But sometimes dad does express himself like mother, and deep down in his heart, he loves his children if he's the right kind of dad. Here we find this father said, go bring that best robe and put it on the boy. Put it on him. He doesn't have to put it on him. Said, put it on him. This is a type of God's righteousness being placed on us done for him and then he also said not only bring that best robe but he said i want you to put a ring on his finger that speaks of authority let him know he's somebody around here this dad concerned about that boy had the robe put on the boy had the ring put on his finger he didn't have to put it on himself he put it on there for him he's somebody he's my son verse 22 put a ring on his hand this speaks of a seal this speaks of the holy spirit this speaks of ownership this speaks of never ending love this speaks of a mark of honor and esteem. Joseph, when he wrote in Pharaoh's chat and prime minister of Egypt, had a ring placed on his finger. Placed on his hand, which speaks of labor, the ring and of the Holy Spirit. We must labor for him in the Spirit. Put the ring on his finger. He's my son. Then he said, I want you to put shoes on his feet. Servants went barefooted. Sons could wear shoes. The boy's barefooted. He's come out of the hog pen. He has no shoes anymore. Put some shoes on him. I want my boy to have shoes on his feet. He's my son. He wants to serve. He wants to be with us here. He is one of our sons. And that speaks of provision for daily walk. God wants us to serve him daily and walk for him. In Exodus chapter 12 and verse 11, And thus shall you eat with shoes on your feet. God said to the Israelites, Get some shoes on. You're leaving here. You're going across the desert. Those Israelites, everyone put on a pair of shoes, and they lasted 40 years through the wilderness. After the 40-year journey, the shoes are just as good a shape as they were when they put them on. And so Jesus said in Mark chapter 6 and verse, uh, chapter 6 verse 9, be shod with sandals. God wants service out of us. He wants to do some walking and serving. And every young man ought to be willing to help his dad around the house, on the job, in the farm, on the farm. Like every young daughter ought to be willing to help mother wash the dishes, sweep the house, make up the beds, and be a good daughter to help mother. Every son ought to be anxious to help his dad and say, Dad, what else can I do? Can I help you a little more? My daddy, I love him. God bless his memory. He's in heaven today. And I'll tell you right now, if I could call back my days, there'd be times when I'd go to my dad and say, Dad, can I stay here in your business a few minutes and let you go get a little nap? Or if you've got to go to town for something, and can I kindly take care of your, your business here for you? Let him get away. But... I didn't do that like I should have. I was busy doing other things for myself and my family. But if I could go back and call my days over, I'd do a lot of things to my dad I didn't do whenever he was alive. And some of you people sitting back there that have your dads right now, you can do those things. You can say, Daddy, can I help take the load off of you? Daddy, can I help you in a way? What can I do now for you? You'd be so glad you did when they're dead and gone. You'll miss them. You won't really miss them after they're gone. But when they're gone, you'll miss them. And of course, your dad would appreciate a son like that. They'd love you for They might not say much about it, but they notice those little things. They just love you for that. They appreciate that. A lot of parents see the difference in their children. Maybe where one would be like that, another would be, I don't care, unconcerned, get all I can out of my dad. I'm going to do my thing, none of his business. i got more sense than he has. These dads notice things like that. They really do. And then the dad said, all right, now let's have a feast. Let's have a good time. The boy's back home. I want you to go kill the fatted calf. Verse 23. And they went out and killed the fatted calf. They didn't get old poor John or some skeleton walking around. They had a calf that they had put up there in the stall and fattened up for 
a special occasion and dad said go get the fatted calf the one that's ready to kill now we're going to have some beef steak around here and have a jubilee this boy is back home and and make him welcome we want him to sit down at the table he hadn't had a good meal in a long long time he's been eating slop that the hogs ate down at the hog pit we're going to fix him a good old steak they went out and killed that fatted calf the service did they came back and fixed it all up and grilled it like they did in those days and placed it on the table and there the father and the son and those around there came in and they began to eat and they had music they began to make music i'd like to heard that music wouldn't you they began to make music and they danced for glee and they thank god that that boy had come back home and his father didn't say now nah, buddy you deserve what you got he just said son you're back home now the father knew he had learned his lesson he didn't have to tell him he knew that People learn their lessons. A lot of times you don't have to tell them. They know it. And this boy had really learned his lesson. And he's back home now ready to do business. And I guarantee you he did business from there on in. You couldn't have driven him away anymore. He did what he could. He appreciated what his father had done for him. And he was willing to do what he could to the glory of God. Fathers have a little tenderness in their heart for their children. Many times that they don't manifest. Like the father's what wears in your cell and he had to be gone for several weeks and came back and it was his birthday, or rather Father's Day. And when he came back, he had three little daughters. And they dressed real neatly and they came out to meet Daddy. And the two oldest daughters had fixed him up a nice little gift. But the little baby daughter was a cripple. She was in a brace. One little arms hanging down by her side. She'd never be able to use, never be able to walk. She was a little baby child. They didn't think she would pay any attention to the oldest daughter's giving daddy a Father's Day gift. But you know what the little thing did? Going out to meet her daddy, she didn't have a gift for daddy. And she saw a little daisy, a little flower there, and the little thing bent over the little braced leg and crippled arm and picked that beautiful little daisy. And when the other little girls gave daddy their Father's Day gift, this little one, with a smile on his little face, his little crippled arm, and in his brace, reached up and handed Daddy that little daisy. You know what Daddy did? He grabbed that little thing, and he hugged it and kissed it, and he took that little daisy. And nothing could have taken that from that man that was so precious, since that little crippled child could not get a gift, but willing to do what it could for Dad. These things are always appreciated by parents when their children do them, and we need to realize that. Need to always understand that many times though dad might not express his feeling, it's right there. Many times mothers express their feelings quicker than dads, but deep down in the heart of daddy, that concern is right there. He's one who goes out, labors, works hard, provide for you and give you a home and wish you the best and help you get started in life the best way he can. Let me give you this in closing, a little poem. Little eyes upon you. Their little eyes upon you, and they're watching night and day. Their little ears that quick to take in everything you say. Their little hands all eager to do everything you do. And a little boy who is dreaming of the day he'll be just like you. You're the little fellow's idol. You're the wisest of the wise. In his little mind about you, no suspicion ever rise. He believes in you devoutly, holds it all you say and do. He will say and do in your way when he grows up just like you. There's a wide-eyed little fella who believes you're always right. His ears are always open. He watches day and night. You're setting an example every day in all you do for the little boy who is waiting to grow up to be just like you. Shall we pray? Father, we pray you'll take the message and use it today to the glory of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us all stand, will you please? I'm going to ask Debbie to play her stanza, and as she plays a stanza, so if you're in this building unsaved, you want to come back to God, you want to join the church, you may feel free to come forward while you play a stanza, Debbie, will you please?
I want everybody but the fathers to be seated. I want all the fathers to remain standing. All fathers remain standing with you, please. I want you to kind of glance around. All right, let's give them a hand. All right, that's fine, okay. All the fathers under 70 years old, be seated. If there's anybody over 70, remain standing if you're a father. All the fathers under 70, be seated. Brother Stevenson, how old are you, sir? You'll be 80 years old the 10th of next month. God bless you. Let's give Brother Steve a hand. Come down here, sir. I have a little gift for you. Would you come down here? Let me give you a little gift. Come right on down. Amen. Brother Stevenson had a precious wife. It's gone on to be with the Lord. She is one of our members. She loved this church. She loved the pastor. Now I know he misses her greatly, and he's looking forward to meeting her on the other side. Brother Stevenson, God bless you, brother. We love you. God bless your heart. Been praying for you here. There's a picture of the, of the beautiful city of Jerusalem. I want you to take that. You won that on Father's Day. They, you're, 80, you're 80 years old? That's right. 10th of next month. 10th of next month, you'll be 80. God bless you. I hope you see many more. We love you. God bless you. You may go back to your seat. He lives in Greensburg. He came all the way up here and be in the service today. God bless him. He spent some lonely hours since his wife went home about a year ago to be with the Lord. Lives by himself down there. God bless you, brother. Nobody knows if they go through an experience like that. Nobody realizes how hard it is for dad to be left behind with little children to try to raise. My heart is so broken when this woman is killed out here last week. Left four little children, 16 and under. My wife saw that. She said, yes, she's 20 feet of the accident and saw it every bit. Awful thing to happen. All right, do we have a father here 25 years younger, younger? Would you stand up? Father 25 or younger, 25 years old or younger. What's the matter you men? I was grandfather at 39. <laughs> My goodness, I was father before I was 20. Goodness, it's old these people. I can't understand you men. All right, do we have, uh, do we have one 26 uh, younger? Oh, 26. All right, how old are you, brother? You're 26. Okay, now that, uh, you know, I get that French name of yours. <coughs> All messed up. Give us your name again. Yeah, okay, that's it. You heard it. <laughs> All right, come down here, dear brother. I have a little gift for you. Now, this is a, a sister, Silver Queen's son in law. And I think it's a Sikh's son in law, too. Listen, this is a little gift from the Holy Land that came from the Holy Land. That's a beautiful little nail clipper. And that little design of a flower there from the Holy Land. I hope you cherish it very highly. God bless you. This is our youngest. Let's give him a youngest child. Hey, God bless you. You may go back to your seat. That's wonderful, isn't it? 